Welcome to the Regeneration International Podcast. All right. So I am here with Tracy Lloyd McCurdy. She is the co-alchemist of the Acres of Ancestry Initiative and the Black Agrarian Fund. And she is the co-founder and executive director of the Black Belt Justice Center, a legal and advocacy nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and regeneration of African-American farmlands and land-based livelihoods through effective legal representation, advocacy, and community education. For over 15 years, Tracy has served as a legal advocate on a range of issues disparately impacting the African diaspora community. However, her most cherished work has been in the service of multi-generational farm families living in the rural South. And that is what we're going to talk about today. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you so much, Alexis, for having me. All right, so let's start at the beginning. I've been watching the incredible videos that you all have at Acres of Ancestry on your YouTube page. And there are a series of interviews with black farmers that everybody needs to watch. It's a very important history lesson that goes back to the Civil War. And one of there are several farmers, but one of the farmers is Eddie Slaughter. And we're going to show a piece of his video, not right away. I want to start with uh, just a quote from his first video that you all have. Um, and I can share a little bit about the video. Um, the Pickford Legacy Farmers, Eddie Slaughter, Carl Parker, and Lucius Abrams, they were representing themselves pro se in federal court, uh, fighting again for their farmlands. Many of them have faced foreclosure since the disastrous implementation of the Pickford v. Glickman class action racial discrimination lawsuit, the consent decree back in 1999. So during the time period of 2009 and 2013, uh, Eddie Slaughter, the legacy farmer, traveled throughout the Black Belt interviewing Pickford legacy farmers uh, to uh, document uh, the the devastation of the aftermath, because again, many of these farmers were left in unconscionable debt. That was the result of this billion dollar settlement. And so we were deeply inspired by uh, this fearless, uh, courageous, persistent Black farmer-led organizing. And so we took a film crew to interview them as well, again, to document the suffering of Black farmers. And we used it as a tool of uh, to to amplify the Black Farmers Appeal Cancel Pick for Debt campaign and to really push uh, a national discourse on the importance and urgency of canceling the debt of Black farmers. So I wanted to contextualize it while you were. Yes, this is perfect. Okay, so now you can see it. Okay. Yes, I can. All right, I'm going to hit it on full screen. Can you still see it? Yes. Okay, great. So. So in, in one of these video interviews with Eddie Slaughter, he talks about how this all started. He says, when we came out of slavery in America, that was 1865, 45 years later in 1910, we had amassed 16 millions, million acres of land in this country. How could that happen? We were uneducated, we had no political clout, we had none of that. But in the South, the Confederate money was no good. They had no more free, free labor. They had all of this land and didn't know how to farm it. So large black families, two or three of them could get together and they could farm 300 to 400 acres of land. Before they got rid of the Freedmen's Bureau, they were buying up land, being paid for their labor. So I wanna stop there and um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a minute. And I just want to, to settle in that time period for a minute, when we think about how this land, how hard it was earned. Um, it's mm -hmm. an extraordinary history of pure grit. There were 3.9 million people emancipated from slavery in 1865. We've heard about the promise of 40 acres and a mule, but we know that in reality, black farmers coming out of slavery got nothing. Even the 400 acres that were negotiated in an agreement with General Sherman were taken back after Lincoln was shot. So it was without any help that black farmers managed to peacefully take possession of 16 million acres of land over 45 years. So Tracy, what more do you want to say about that extraordinary achievement? 
I think that it's important to uh, add to the discussion uh, that when we talk about uh, federal ag policy, many of our farmers still refer to USDA as the last plantation. So when we look at what happened in 1862, we have the Homestead Act, which violently transferred over 240 million acres of land from indigenous nations to mostly white male farmers, uh, settlers. Then in uh, 1866, we had the Southern Homestead Act, which also transferred 46 million acres of land from indigenous nations, again, to mostly white male settlers. With that, even though um, African Americans were supposed to be able to apply um, to receive uh, land titles, only a thousand uh, Black families were able to acquire mm -hmm. land titles under the Southern Homestead Act of mm -hmm. 1866. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to also lift up this week on October 14th was uh, what would have been George Floyd's uh, birthday. And I don't know how many of your listeners know this history, but his great, great grandfather, Hillary Thomas Stewart Jr. was born at the end of slavery during Reconstruction, he acquired, again, through grit and determination, over 500 acres of land. And he lost that land due to uh, white uh, criminality, uh, collusion, uh, economic and physical violence. And George Floyd's grandparents worked as sharecroppers, and they were never able to climb out a cycle of debt to again, lift up their family and provide intergenerational intergenerational wealth, excuse me, through the land. And so I think that's really important for us to, to understand. When you talked about the 16 million acres of land that our ancestors were able to acquire through their own grit and determination and without the support of the federal government, it's important to note that during the period of 1865 and 1870, uh, Black farmers put over $16 million uh, in the Freedmen's Bank from, from their efforts. And over 70% of that money went to acquiring land. So they understood that land was um, crucial, was central to Black liberation, economic autonomy, and sovereignty. Yeah, I, that's, that reminds me of another quote from Eddie Slaughter's talk where he talks about if you're landless, you're helpless. And he talked about all the things that having land protected you against, including like if you're wrongly in prison, you can post bail based on having land. And it's it's a, a very important insurance policy. I think a lot of people feel that today. They want that type of security. And it's, it's a terrible crime that that's been deprived basically wholesale to Black Americans. That's so- story. Can I share real quick of a yeah. former, his name is Willie Head. His uh, grandfather, Judge Head, was a, a sharecropper. And it's important to share this story because uh, Willie Head still farms on this land legacy that his grandfather provided him. And so as the story goes, his grandfather was sharecropping and there was a piece of a plot of land that came open. Uh, 73 acres of land, and the landowner told uh, Judge Head, his grandfather, if you're able to come up with the down payment, I'll help you finance the rest. So there was a clearing of uh, a, a parcel of land, and with a mule, Judge Head uh, removed what uh, Willie had estimated to be over 3,000 stumps that were the size of the, the uh, front of a truck with his mule. And that's how he was able to acquire the down payment. And that's why Willie uh, Head is on the land today. Grit and determination. And what is so um, uh, egregious mm -hmm. is that the erosion of the Black agricultural land base, the federal government has been the primary culprit. And so we can, we can get into that. And that is the travesty of the Black um, farmers lawsuit, the Pickford v. Glickman class action racial discrimination lawsuit that our black farmers organized tirelessly 
1997, driving their pickup trucks around the country, speaking with other farmers and learning that what was happening to them was happening across the black agrarian community with uh, delays in loans, with them reducing the amount of loans, with them um, uh, making the farmers have what they call supervised accounts, well, where the farmers, they were approved of the loan, but in order to access the money, they needed the signature of the farm service agency loan officer. And so what would happen, the farmer would uh, report to the local FSA office, to get the signature of the loan officer and he wasn't there. And so that would happen over and over and over again. And it caused uh, unconscionable delays with them being able to farm. Uh, the, the county committee system, which has a history of um, uh, being an apparatus of white supremacy. One of the farmers in the video that we shared, uh, we called it debt after death. This is uh, mm -hmm. Carl Parker. His father actually uh, served on a county committee. And then um, for some reason, he was no longer on the county committee and he applied for a loan and he was in dire financial straits. He needed the money to continue planting and they denied the loan. And on that same day, he um, suffered from a massive heart attack mm. and the family was in debt over $500,000. And what's really sad is that due to the egregious implementation of the Pigford v. Glickman class action racial discrimination lawsuit, Carl Parker is now in debt over a million dollars. Mm. And this is racialized. This is contested debt. Mm. Wow. All right. So let's back up just a little bit so that people understand the, the, um, the timeline. All right. So we got to 1910, 16 million acres of land, and now about 3 million, and then perhaps down to one and a half million because of the mismanagement of Pigford. But let's let's talk just now about how how that shrunk from 16 million to to three million from 1910 to the around 2000. Yes, absolutely. I can share this story because there's so many stories uh, to uh, further. Uh, illustrate what happened to the black farmer. There's a farmer, his name is Bernard Bates. He's from Hill City, Kansas. His grandfather was an exoduster. So he actually, his grandfather was one of the um, thousands of, of black farmers that moved to Nicodemus, Kansas uh, to settle there and to flee from uh, uh, white supremacy and uh, violent terrorism. And so his grandfather was able to acquire 250 acres of land. And I think some of that land came surprisingly from the Homestead Act, but he was able to acquire land. Uh, Bernard Bates was able to build upon that land uh, and amass 950 acres of land. Uh, in 1983, he started to experience uh, discrimination uh, from the local uh, credit association, the land bank, uh, the local FSA office. And he wrote then his senator, Bob Dole. And he also wrote, and we have this in our archives. Uh, we have a community archives on our website. He also wrote President Ronald Reagan. The um, FSA administrator responded to uh, former Bernard Bates and said essentially, uh, there's nothing that we can do about this. And then later on in 1983, this is a part of the history, President Ronald Reagan dismantled the Office of Civil Rights, the very arm that is charged with investigating discrimination complaints. So imagine over a period of 13 years, because it wasn't reopened again until the Clinton years, all of those complaints they said were either trashed um, and just sat there. And meanwhile, Black farmers were losing their land. And I think it's really important to make the connection because recently there was um, the Office of Inspector General released a report. And the report revealed that uh, the typical uh, time period for uh, investigation of discrimination complaints is 180 days. But this report found that this is current day now, 
that in 2019, it took the Office of Civil Rights 800 days to investigate discrimination complaints. So then the question that I posit to the group is, what is the difference between uh, the actions of President uh, uh, Ronald Reagan and the effectiveness now of the Office of Civil Rights under whatever administration, right? Whether it's Republican or Democrat. And so I think it really speaks to um, the invisibility of the suffering of black farmers. And so I really wanna stress that. So just to loop back to the question, we are still, um, we have an issue with confronting specifically anti-black racism within uh, USDA, the local FSA offices, and the county committee system. Yeah, it's ongoing. Um, but let's take it back to prior to the Pigford lawsuit. So the in 1997, I guess that was the first time that the government acknowledged that the racist practices were happening within the USDA. And the USDA released a report on racial discrimination, its own racial discrimination against black farmers. And there were congressional hearings at that time. And then the first lawsuits were brought. And that was a story that I was told. The, the farmers won, it was happily ever after. But these cases, which are known by the name of one of the farmer plaintiffs, Timothy Pigford, the Pigford lawsuit was settled in 1999 for almost $1 billion and $1 billion has been paid to more than 13,300 farmers. And that's the largest civil rights settlement ever. So that seemed like a huge victory. And that's the story that I learned. But actually the result was that, you know, 13,300 farmers are, are paid, but 17,000 black farmers are left with crushing debt. So the USDA was supposed to pay them for the racial discrimination, but the farmers actually end up paying the USDA because of this ongoing continuous racial discrimination. And, and if, if we can bear with me one more time to let me share my screen, I'd like to, to show you another slide from um, another video made about the farmers that did the Pigford lawsuit. So Michael Stovall was first rejected by a USDA loan officer in the 1990s when he was 29 years old. And I guess this is in, as you're telling us, Tracy, this is in this era where the racism was very overt and Reagan shut down the Office of Civil Rights and these things were, were going on with full approval of the USDA system. But it, I guess in the Clinton administration then, finally an investigation determines that he was rejected because of racism, but it didn't stop there. And he, he tells his story, he says, it was just ongoing from there all the way up to today. And this is an interview that was done with him this year. So he says, I was steady trying to get them to do right by me. And every time I would do so, they would retaliate against me. They've been trying to foreclose on me for 21 years. This farm has sat vacant for 21 years. This is what they do to black farmers across the United States of America. So Tracy, I think it's really important. I just wanted Alexis to share when, we are finally lifting the miseducation fog around the Pigford v. Glickman class action racial discrimination lawsuit. And if you're a farmer, you know that a cash payment of $50,000 is not um, going to help you even buy a tractor, right? Mm -hmm. And so what happened, there was a professor from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University back in 1999 that informed the court that it would cost at least $250,000 for black farmers to re-enter agriculture. Those $50,000 cash payments were based on the payments made to the Tuskegee, Tuskegee experiment survivors. It was not based on real economic harm. The farmers were poorly represented by their attorneys. So for example, the farmers were charged with finding a similarly situated white farmer that had not been discriminated against. Mind you, their attorneys had negotiated away discovery. How were they, they didn't have the capacity or the access to the documents to prove 
that there was a similarly situated white farmer. And the reality is the similarly situated white farmer was a myth because they were never similarly situated. And so we know this now when we look at the fact that 98% of the land is owned by European Americans and less than 2% of uh, farmers are African American. How did that happen? The egregious miscarriage of justice with the Pigford lawsuit is a part of that. When you talked about the uh, 15,000 uh, farmers that receive the the cash payments around at the time, only 4.8% of the $1 billion settlement went to canceling debts. So many of those farmers have been suffering in debt over the last 22 years, right? And I think it's really glaring when we look at, and I know we're going to get into this later, uh, the debt cancellation program out of the 22,000 eligible farmers right now is BIPOC, but it will likely be expanded to include uh, European American farmers. Um, out of the 22,000 BIPOC farmers that were eligible for debt cancellation prior to um, the uh, federal judge in Wisconsin issuing the temporary restraining order, only 3,100 out of the 22,000 were black farmers, right? Only 3,100 out of the 22,000. Less than 5% of all black farmers would receive debt cancellation. And when we started our campaign to cancel the debt, we thought, again, the number was 17,000. That's the number we had been told, and it made sense considering the history of Pigford. So what we realize now is that over the last 22 years, the policy of USDA, which is essentially, let's just wait for the black farmer to ascend to ancestorhood. They just wait it out. Um, many of the farmers, there was another farmer, uh, Janie Bell Bimbry from Hawkinsville, Georgia. She ascended to the land of the ancestors earlier this year. Back in 2011, USDA initiated foreclosure proceedings against her. She's a Pigford legacy farmer and the family was forced to get a private loan to pay off the USDA debt. And thus under this uh, prescriptive, the budget reconciliation language uh, with that carries the debt cancellation provision, they would be excluded because it's a private loan. So this is the devastation that uh, now the media is just picking up on. And so it's really an uh, empowering time for our farmers because no one, they have suffered largely over the last 22 years and no one heard their cries really, right? Um, until this moment. So one of the farmers said, you know, uh, I love elders hanging out with them because they have uh, so much elder wit. And he said, sometimes God sends a blessing and the devil delivers it, right? So sometimes God sends a blessing and the devil delivers it. So now we had the pandemic and we were able through advocacy to enfold the issue of the debt cancellation of the pig for legacy farmers in this other narrative of the crushing debt of many farmers, but particularly BIPOC farmers. So that is kind of um, the, 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 the history of Pigford that I think, again, when we talk about the Emergency Relief for Farmers of Color Act or the Justice for Black Farmers Act, it started, the roots are in the Pigford case, rectifying the injustices of the Pigford lawsuit. So Tracy, we queued up the video from Eddie Slaughter's um, interview. Would you like to, to show that now? Absolutely. When you look at the uh, Fifth Amendment to the Constitution that guarantees us due process, that means that you can go into court and you can present your side and the evidence and, and on the merits, you can present your case to them. But what it looks like for us, because I don't know anyone that has been able to go into court, it reminds me of 1857 in the Dred Scott decision, when the United States Supreme Court and the Chief Justice at that time was a Roger B. Taney, said that the Negro had no right that the white man was bound to respect. He was nothing more than an ordinary article of merchandise, as a hog, a cow, or a chicken. And wherever commerce were concerned or profit to be made by it, you know, so be it. He was nothing more than an ordinary article of merchandise. 
So obviously 1857 still apply to us even going into the 21st century because out of all of these black farmers that we had, I don't know one that have been able to be heard in court, his case on the marriage. You know, that's uh, uh, Lucius Abrams, Cecil Brewing, to the end of the lead plaintiffs, you know. And for us, for them to say that we have justice, that's a moral disgrace. Ain't no justice in America. Equal justice under the law still do not exist in America for the black and the poor. And the black farmers lawsuit bad this out. It bears it out. Mm. I want to share something about Eddie Slaughter. He is 71 years old. He's a double amputee. He's blind in one eye. And he received the $50,000 uh, cash payment. Because he still had debt over 200000 USDA for over nine years, um, garnished, offset, what they call offset, his social security, his disability, his peanut subsidy, the $200 stimulus check, and um, that amounted to over $41,000. This is the result of the Pigford lawsuit. How could this happen? I mean, how could this be the result where the federal government that acknowledged it's well documented, the anti-Black racism that dates back to the documentation goes back to 1965, and yet this class action racial discrimination lawsuit resulted in the farmers being in this unconscionable debt. And I think it's really important. Uh, you know, when people talk about the cash payments, the farmers always wanted their land. The Pickford lawsuit was about the land because they knew that if they had the land and the debt was extinguished, then they had their sovereignty. And many of them wanted to get out from what they call USDA, the last plantation, their over-dependency on uh, monoculture, agriculture, commodity, uh, commodity crops, right? But over the last 22 years, their freedom dreams have been arrested. So many of them are so excited to talk to the returning generation of Black farmers that are talking about hemp production, that are talking about medical marijuana, regenerative agriculture, because they recognize that that system of uh, exploitation of farm workers, of black farmers and the land is unsustainable. And what has happened, they haven't been able to uh, engage or even stand in their imagination fully of organic agriculture because it is unconscionable debt. And consequently, they did not have access to capital. That's the other piece that we don't really talk about and and what has happened to them you know and how has that impacted um their families the generational impact of that of that devastation so i have a lot of respect for uh elder slaughter because he's still fighting his debt was actually canceled because again he had an operating loan and so his debt was canceled uh last year but many of the farmers that had debt, again, Pickford was about the land. The land, uh, the farm ownership loans have not been canceled. And that's why we launched the Black Farmers Appeal Cancel Pickford Debt Campaign. Yeah, well, tell us about that. That was going to be where I wanted to go next. It, you've had an amazing victory, and yet you haven't been able to realize it completely yet. So, But tell us first about how you, over the last couple of years, you've been doing this Cancel Pig for Debt campaign. And earlier this year, you all won an amazing victory. Tell us that part. Oh, absolutely, Alexis. And again, I always want to situate that our work is very much a continuation of 30 years of Black farmer-led organizing and advocacy. So uh, we have to start with Senator Elizabeth Warren. When Senator Elizabeth Warren was running for president, uh, she wrote uh, a piece in the Washington Post addressing black land loss. And it was a narrow lens. It was talking about the phenomenon of heirs property, which has contributed to black land loss. But the black agrarian community, uh, we pushed back and we said, we have to deal with institutional discrimination within USDA. So that started this 
community-based participatory process of policymaking. And we co-created uh, with the Warren campaign a robust policy platform to dismantle institutional discrimination within USDA. Uh, it was an incredible document. Many of the farmers said they never had a presidential candidate address uprooting institutional discrimination within USDA. So then we jumped on the Justice for Black Farmers Act train with Senator Cory Booker. And that was uh, an incredible piece of legislation that was int introduced in 2020 and then reintroduced in 2021, January 2021. And we wrote, co uh, collaborated on the language to extinguish the debt for our pick for legacy farmers. Now, that language inspired the language in the Emergency Relief for Farmers of Color Act, which was introduced by Senator uh, Reverend Raphael Warnock. Now, I think we can look back at the political lesson of that because it was an expansive, we expanded uh, recovery to uh, BIPOC farmers. And the challenge has been in court. And this has always been the challenge in court. Again, we heard Slaughter talk about uh, the Dred Scott decision. The farmers have been fighting the last 22 years for recovery to no avail. And so what has happened, we have this conundrum. And you know, as an attorney, the constitutional standard and has been uh, for any type of race-based remedy is uh, strict scrutiny. Is it narrowly tailored uh, to advance a compelling government interest? And so I stopped counting after uh, the 12 lawsuits, it's 12 law lawsuits and counting from many white farmers that receive subsidies. Uh, one of our colleagues, the Environmental Working Group, they actually have a database of farmers that receive subsidies. And you can go, many of the farmers that are challenging this debt cancellation provision, they receive uh, massive amounts of subsidies, right? Because a lot of the subsidies are based on acreage, which USDA has been complicit in uh, severely reducing the land acreage of black farmers. And so that has been the challenge. Uh, the Department of Justice actually this was a political article. They said that they're not going to uh, appeal uh, the decision because there is a concern of the ramifications. If this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, what could happen? Uh, there could be a, a tremendous impact across um, various programs that are uh, committed to race-based remediation. So what we're working on now is uh, curative language in the Build Back Better budget reconciliation. Uh, it's a $3.5 trillion budget. I did hear that the budget might uh, be cut down to $2 trillion. The ag budget was $135 billion. And so there is uh, the House Ag Committee, where well, the Republicans leaked uh, the markup bill. And in that bill, there are various criteria. So it's race neutral criteria uh, that we hope will advance racial equity. Uh, the issue again for us, since we know so few black farmers will receive debt cancellation, we want a commitment to put more money uh, in the budget, um, uh, in the debt cancellation provision. There was one part, which was debt cancellation. The second part was a billion dollar fund to restore BIPOC um, agricultural land basis. And so what we want to do is another allocation of funds and direct payments. One of the critiques of federal ag policy, what has been, is that white farmers get direct payments, black farmers get process. You know, we get the process. We get, uh, uh, last week they announced the formation of an equity commission. We're way beyond the equity commission. We need direct payments. And so that is uh, the work. Uh, uh, we're excited. We hope to run our victory lap soon. Our sugarcane farmers, we said we're going to have a caravan throughout the South and we're going to start in Louisiana once we get this debt canceled. Because one of the uh, farm families from Louisiana, the Seagues, they're picked for legacy farmers. Their debt ballooned from $500,000 to now $1.5 million in debt. 
And they, one of the things that President Biden, the Biden-Harris administration did back in January, they issued a foreclosure moratorium. And the CQs were actually in a foreclosure proceeding. So imagine this was immediate relief to them, immediate relief. And so I just, I, um, one of the farmers, sometimes they can get, um, there's so much despair because this year alone, I can count five or six black farmers that have ascended to the land of the ancestors without restorative land justice from USDA. And I'm reminded of the quote from Zora Neale Hurston when she said, I've been in Sorrow's kitchen and I licked out all the pots. And then I've stood on a peaky mountain wrapped in rainbows with a harp and sword in my hand. And I think that is the, uh, the, the experience of black farmers in this country equal uh, joy and sorrow. And we carry both in this campaign. Oh, it's, an, it's been an amazing ride for you. you. You got Congress to pass $4 billion in debt relief. And then, like you said, all of these white farmers who have gotten plenty of federal subsidies came and said that they were being discriminated against, which is, I mean, I just can't understand how the courts could have considered that as logical at all. But that's where you are. And so um, so I have one more slide, if we can bear to have me share my screen one last time. Can you see that, Tracy? Yes, absolutely. Thank All you right. so much. Take it away. So what's our call to action? What should we do our, now? Yeah, our call to action is to call Congress, both the Senate and the House Agriculture Committees. Of course, uh, Chairwoman Debbie Stabenow of the Senate Ag Committee and Representative David Scott, the chair chairperson for the House Ag Committee. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be hearing about uh, the, the, the bill. The House will be voting on it before it goes to the Senate. And we really, there are two things that we want. We want to make sure that the debt is canceled for all Black farmers, but then we also want an allocation. We want an allocation we're demanding at least 15 billion to go into the section 1006, which is the fund to restore the black agricultural land base. Mm -hmm. We would love support uh, from your community if they would consider making donations to uh, Acres of Ancestry Black Agrarian Fund so mm -hmm. that we can provide those um, donations and love offerings to our farmers. Again, everybody expected the debt to be canceled expeditiously. Over the last couple of years, Black farmers have been foreclosed on, their accounts have been offset. So we really didn't understand the delay. And there's a real feeling um, and sentiment within the Black agrarian community that Secretary Vilsack slow walked, you know, that there was um, uh, obstructionism with this with a, a speedy implementation of debt cancellation. And consequently, we're here. And the black farmers, again, the narrative, the timeline is different. They haven't just been suffering through the pandemic, but it goes back to 1999. And many of them, thousands of them have ascended to ancestorhood without, without um, restorative land justice from USDA and their land lineages forever severed, right? So I, I thank you so much for affording me the opportunity to amplifying the, 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 our campaign and the suffering and the determination of black farmers. One of the farmers, uh, Bernice Atchison from Chilton County, County, Alabama, she says what she tells her daughters is, um, you have two feet to stand and two wings to fly. And I think that's where we are in this historical moment uh, with respect to black farmers. Thank you so much, Tracy. We'll be following the campaign and we'll let people know how they can donate and take action. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.